In 1949, Nancy Randolph Davis broke racial barriers when she became the first black student to enroll at then Oklahoma A&M. Davis wasn't trying to make history. She just wanted to earn her master's degree in her home state. She graduated in 1952 and spent the next four decades teaching. 75 years later, Davis remains one of Oklahoma State's most distinguished alumni. I had the pleasure of sitting down with her son, Calvin Davis, to learn more about his mother's lasting impact. What was the most significant factor of your mom choosing to attend Oklahoma State? That's a great question. I, let, me, let me elaborate on that. So the greatest factor came down in the 1930s when my mother would listen to the ag report with her father, Ed Napoleon Randolph, and he was a patriarch of the family, and, and uh, anything Papa said, her father said to her, it was golden. It was the law because he was Papa Randolph, and everybody kind of felt that way in the family, everybody, even cousins. But the point is that they were listening to the Ag Report, in which they would do, and at one point in time he told her that that is a wonderful school that they built there in Stillwater. They have a great Ag program, that's a great school. He told her at one time, another occasion, that you know, such a great school there that they have, I bet you, she, he didn't say I bet you, he says one day Negroes will be allowed to go there. Those were his words. And he looked at her and said, Nancy, one day you'll go there. And she believed it. And she took it to heart and she said, it will happen. Even though it didn't happen right away, it did happen with her being persistent because she was told when she first, uh, the second time I think she went, that they, she, they, she was told, I remember she said, Black people are moving too fast. You can't force this. She says, I'm not trying to force anything. She said, they, they even offered to do something for her that they did for African Americans going to graduate school. They said, we'll pay for you to go to Kansas, Illinois, California. They will take you, they'll, they'll accept you. And she says, no, I want to go here because my father said it. And her, she, she mentioned that too, but she says, because that's where I want to go. Again, I mentioned she had help, you know, the NAACP and Amos T. Hall, Roscoe Dungy, uh, who was the editor of the Black, Black Dispatch newspaper in Oklahoma City. But she kept coming back and finally it happened because she was persistent, but she also knew that it was going to happen because Papa Randolph said it. And it was going to happen. He heard from God, apparently. And so she says, oh, so it's, it's got to happen. What was her degree in? It was home economics. You said she said it so matter-of-factly. Yes. But what she did was not matter-of-fact no. at all. Why do you think she was so nonchalant about something so groundbreaking? Yeah. So it, it goes to belief. And, and uh, of course, she always started with God, uh, like her father did. But it was kind of one of those things when, when, when her father, Ed Napoleon Randolph, told her that. She believed it. And then she didn't just believe it. She said she, she saw it happening and she, she went about executing. It, it didn't happen right away. She executed it by not giving up, being uh, uh, someone who was, uh, who, was, who was persevering, but yet consistent because she didn't, it didn't happen just immediately. And she had to get some help. NAAC, NAACP, um, the editor of the uh, Black Dispatch newspaper in Oklahoma City uh, supported her. She didn't do it by herself but she knew that it was going to happen one way or another, and it did. What do you think the challenges were for her as not just the first black enrollee at Oklahoma State, but also being a black woman in a predominantly white university? Right, right. So you think about it. She did not have um, the option to stay on campus. Of course, in 1949, uh, African-Americans had to go to the back of the uh, the buildings to get food, the back, back of restaurants. Um, African Americans had to uh, drink from separate water fountains, had uh, inferior equipment and books and schools. So it was something that she grew up with when she was born in 1926, all the way to, you know, until things started to change. Probably really not until, well, 1949, OSU changed things for her, but the nation hadn't changed, okay? So, so she, she 
knew that, she, but she didn't like it. Just like when her, I was speaking today about her grandfather, and that story goes where she was a child, uh, about eight years old, and just two blocks from the family home, her grandfather was riding in a wagon, a horse-drawn wagon, and a truck hit that wagon, fatally wounded him. The ambulance came. They would not take him to a hospital because the hospital there did not take, as they said, Negroes, African-Americans. They did take the other party driving the truck, who happened to be white, but she saw this happening and she saw where the family had to bring grandpa back and put him on the floor. And she cried, grandpa, grandpa, she uncontrollably crying. She was very, very close with her grandfather. And she realized then that things were not equal. Then he died. And that left an impression on her. Of course, it led her to easily accept a position uh, uh, when Doc, uh, Governor David Walters in 1992 asked her to serve on the state nursing board. She was quick to say yes, understandably. But there are other challenges, obviously, that we don't know about. I mean, even, even coming back and forth. I will say this, though. Uh, once she, uh, the story, you may, may be getting ahead of you, but the story where, where it goes, where uh, she ultimately was able to get accepted and come into the classroom, she made friends. Those white students uh, made friends. There were some who were from Tulsa and Sepulpa. They started giving each other rides back and forth. So it was just a matter of, of, of time and really it's, it's divine intervention how all this happened. And uh, but, but there, there's so many different pieces to it and some that she probably shared with some people. We talked a whole lot, but it was a matter of just, it was going to happen and it did. It was a matter of fact. It wasn't a big deal other than it was supposed to happen and it did. You're a former board member of the NAACP. How much did your mom's history influence you being on that board? board? <laughs> well, I'm going to say she didn't push me to be on the board. What she pushed me to do is like to do what I wanted to do as long as it made sense. And the NAACP made sense because at that time, uh, in the 70s, when I started, uh, really probably the 60s, well, let me back up. When I was born, Clara Looper, who, who I call my aunt because she and my mother were like sisters, she bought my life membership. My life membership in NAACP goes back to the date of my birth. And she, <laughs> she purchased it then. So it was kind of clear where my direction was going to be. But in terms of being on the board of directors, uh, going to the conventions all over, the, dur during the years, uh, 60s, 70s, uh, I met people like the Hubert Humphreys, um, met people who, who were running for office, uh, even later, Jimmy Carter, people like that. And, and I'm gonna tell you, uh, I said I realized people who make a difference uh, are lawmakers, attorneys mainly, and I realized NAACP was the oldest, most influential civil rights organization in the world, and I felt as a young person I could, I could have a voice. And I was always encouraged to speak up and, and have a voice where it was appropriate. And so I was in college, and I ended up being the youngest member on the National Board of Directors at that time. And um, it, it wasn't a matter of, of, of anyone telling me you need to do it. I just decided I wanted to because I was a leader. I realized, not understanding that, but I was, I, was, I guess, uh, nurtured to be a leader. <laughs> and so I just uh, did it, you know? You won numerous awards for your professional work and community service. Which one of those makes you the proudest? <sighs> you know, I, I hate to even, even start going through the list of awards. But anything where I was able to, to help someone, I mean, I, I didn't list, that, list some things. I mean, I, I know I was on the presidential task force for LA's recovery during the riots, but, but one time a, a high school, it's called Estacado High School in Lubbock, Texas, they, they gave me um, an award and it was something to the extent of for advancing human lives. And I said, wow. Sadly, I didn't get to, I wasn't present to get that. But just receiving that was, 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 it just meant a lot to me because, because I, was, I was fighting for that school to, to, get, uh, to stay open, to, to uh, uh, get better programs. And when I say fighting, it was just, just kind of negotiating with the school board, with the group of people, but more so showing up there and, and, and spending time with the students. And when they recognize you for that, and, I, and more so I saw students succeed. I saw them, I saw them, uh, I saw lives changed. And when, and when someone recognizes that, that's great, but more so, it was more important to see what happened. And, and getting the award just says, wow, somebody noticed it, that's, that's great. But, but what, what I want to do is notice those, 
those kids that, that, that actually advanced and, 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 and made a difference, you know. So I don't know. And there, there are other probably examples, but that's, that is the one that comes to mind. And, and that's not one that I re really talk about much because it's not, it's not important about me getting the award. It was more important about ultimately what happened uh, in, the, in, that, in that whole process and whole time period. I think that says a lot about you and your character, and it makes me think of your mom, and I feel like she didn't do that to make history. She did it because she wanted to go to school in her home state and make a difference to others. Yes, that's true, well, and that's the way she raised us, you know. I mean, it, it, sometimes I have to get, get humbled, and, and I tell you, I, I, love, I love the fact that I, I married a woman just like my mother, and she, she keeps me humble in a good way. She'll remind me if I start thinking how I did it on my own. No, you did it because God allowed it. But also, Nancy Randolph Davis and your father, Fred Davis, too, taught you the right way. She's sitting over there. <laughs> She's probably thinking, yep, I did. <laughs> She's shaking her head. <laughs> you can take credit. <laughs> how often have you heard stories from others about the impact your mom has made on their lives? Oh, gosh. Um, I I've heard it all my life. Um, well, I just I remember... Um, the story, I mean, there's so many different ones of, of someone who said, you know, your mother, uh, uh, she sent me, she sent me uh, uh, the money, she, 12, she was $12, and, and this late young lady was in college, and she said, I had no money, but I had been praying, and, 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 but, but Miss Davis would send me things from time to time, but that meant a lot because I had nothing. I had nothing, I didn't know how I was going to get my next meal, but it was on, it was on a weekend, because then I, and she says that, that that meant so much. I've heard people say she's giving her more money or something like that, but it's just because she would sit down at night, I remember, and do her lesson plans, and I see her take her checkbook out. Checkbook out. She would write bills, but my, I found out later, some of her nephews and nieces said she remembered this anniversary, this birthday, uh, always giving and always thinking about others, or someone received a cake that she had wrapped up and ended up sending it to them in, in the mail or something. I don't even remember the question, <laughs> but I can tell you this. I can tell you this. She, she, de she definitely uh, uh, man, changed lives. Uh, other, other examples of people who, uh, who basically felt less than. She always tried to go to that person that felt less than uh, and, and to make them feel better. Um, I, I mean, th there are stories of, of uh, other people who, who I'm, a, I'm a darker skinned African American male. My mother was lighter complexion. My sisters are very light. Uh, my oldest one is very light, almost. <laughs> Your complexion, interestingly enough, um, and she always told me, "I don't want you to feel best or be bad or less than because of the color of your skin, because you're darker, because you're a beautiful black boy, young man, or whatever, and you're beautiful. Your heart, you know, it's about you." And she always talked about how I was handsome. She was correct about that, of course. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm see, I, now that's getting that's getting okay. I know it's not true. I mean, I know, you know, but at the same time, she would make me feel like I was maybe the most handsome kid in the, uh, around. But more so, I was the most blessed kid because, uh, because I cared about others and I loved God and, and, and I tried to do the right thing. I tried to help people. And she always would recognize that, you see. And there's so many stories where other people had that same, who were not, they were not in my family. They were students. And, and someone said, she made, me, she made me proud to be a black woman, or proud to be a black man, or proud to be a, 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 a light skin even. A, a, because, you know, not just because of darkness. So there are people who, who, are, who are comfortable about however they look. Uh, even some you know, white students who said, you know, you made me proud that I'm from a small town. You know, I came to Star Spencer to your high school from a small town. You made me proud of that because I felt, I felt like I was inferior. So it didn't matter who the, kid, who the child or the person was, she wanted to let them know that they were special and she found that area, that little niche that, that they needed help in and she was, she was masterful at it. I, think it was, I think it was just a gift to find out what that person needed. And, and amazingly where there was some tough love that she gave or usually it was, she led with love all the time and she was very sincere, no matter what. They said, Ms. Davis, you told me I had to change my hair I was mad at you, but you were right. I got the job. I mean, there, there are too many stories. I have to write them down, but I'm glad you asked me that. I never thought about that. But, but, but there's so many stories where she changed lives in a micro way that ended up being just a, a big, a, a macro type change. You're a parent. Yes. How important is it to remind your kids that they are enough just as they are? Oh, that means everything. That they are comfortable, not only in their own skin, but they are special 
where they are. I mean, that means a lot. And I, you know, having a son and a daughter, and uh, you know, I know that uh, there are different dynamics. And, and young ladies, especially today, go through a lot of different uh, challenges about you know, the way they look or whatever it may be. Or, or you know, they start out really smart. You find that by the time they get to, to a senior year in high school, they, they're, they're, they don't feel as smart because they're not maybe recognized as much. It's just, it's just the, the, that's the facts of what happens you know, many times. Uh, but it's always important to let them know that you are perfect how you are. My son is autistic. He is perfect. He, make, he makes me a better father because he is perfect the way he is. He is, he, he is the sweetest, the kindest, most, most kiddo. And I would say that, that, that me, my wife Renee, we, she's an amazing mother. I have to give her more credit than myself. I, I, I really do. I'm not saying that I'm, for just any reason. It's because it was a bonus kid for her. I'll say this. But it's like, it's like that, that um, song by Brad Paisley, the, the, uh, the dad that I didn't, you didn't have to be. She's the mother that, she, she, that he didn't have to be. And she, it was perfect that they got together. I, I didn't know that she was going to be that kind of a mom. But that was a gift from God. So I had to give her credit. And, and so he always understands that he is perfect. He's special. My daughter also. She does that. We do that. And so that, that, that makes the difference. That, that's, that could be a difference. The difference between a kid failing and succeeding, but if any kid hears this, don't worry. You're perfect who you are. God made you. You're a champion. You're a winner in your own way. I have my kids do this. Since they, since they could talk, I have them say, I have a, I have a, a chant that they do. And they, have to repeat, they repeat after me. It says, I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm a champion. I'm a child of God. I'm the best of the best. I'm a winner. I'm a champion. We just keep going over that. They know that they are the best of the best because they are. I love that. I love that. Your mom clearly has taught you a lot, instilled a lot of great values in you. What do you think is the most valuable lesson from her? Well, I mean, it, it always starts with belief in God. You have to believe first. And understanding there's nothing too great or too difficult for you to do. If you ask God, if you work hard, and you apply yourself. Now, sometimes you find that, you know, you think you want to do something, but sometimes you ask God, say, no, that's not what, what I want you to do. You may have to pivot. <laughs> Many times I've had to pivot. But you start out with your belief system. She started, always started out with that and believe in yourself. That was one of the greatest uh, things she ever taught me. Uh, uh, there are many great things, but that self-confidence meant everything. What do you hope your mom has taught other people? The same thing. I mean, the things that she taught us, she taught them, but she found the niche as to what that person needed. And um, I think she taught leadership. Um, and just like uh, I, I shared today earlier, that, that leadership started with love, okay? And she searched, taught people to serve like she did, serve with sincerity, be, be for real, be sincere in your service. Make sure it's selfless service. And you have to believe in the service too. You have to believe it. You have to, have to truly have a belief that what you're doing is making a difference or is the proper thing to do. Oklahoma State is celebrating 75 years of her enrolling at then Oklahoma A&M. What does that mean to you? Wow. You know, it, it means more to me that, that, that you all are recognizing her. Uh, you know, because when you look at, at, at what happened from 1949 to 1999, there, there was very little, little said about it. I mean, she mentioned it. Nobody said very much. I mean, it was like kind of, okay, it was known. But boy, once the, the floodgates opened, it was amazing. But more so, what did it do? It, 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 I think more students felt comfortable coming here because I've talked to students who said I came here because of your mom I was able to get your mom's scholarship some some students said that but more so it said to, it said OSU was willing willing to to open their doors I mean no nothing nobody no institution is perfect perfect but this institution it was the first actually it was it was in in June of 1949 when she entered that was before O O U. I mean, even there was there was a Supreme Court case. Ada Lois Scipio Fisher, who was my constitutional law professor, entered O U in August of 1949. So this 
This university did it first. So 75 years of being the first to do that is amazing. And I'm going to tell you, in this, in 2021, when, when Dr. Sherm was, uh, uh, was, was selected as the president as the first female, I mean, that goes more, that goes to the addition, the legacy that continues. You have a female provost, which is, which is also amazing. Uh, it, mean, it means that OSU is making a commitment to, to inclusion, to fairness, to equity. They continue to do that. So, so that 75 years was, was wonderful, but more importantly, it's setting the stage for the next 75 years. And we're on, we're on the right track. I say we, because even though, in all honesty, I didn't go to OSU, and there's a reason behind that, it, it, because, well, I, I can get into that. I, we may not want to talk about that right now. It's a different story. But I used to come here all the time, but I love OSU. I love it for the school that it is, because my mother loved it, despite having some difficulties at, at first. She loved OSU, and, and if I ever start trying to root for OU, she would look at me and give me a mean look, and I'd have to be quiet and act like I didn't appreciate it because, you know, and, uh, back in the day, OU was the football team, but she says, nope, you, don't, you just need to just keep it down a little bit. <laughs> the Cowboys. <laughs> we need to deal with the Cowboys, you know. They want, want them to win. I say, okay, Mom. So she converted me, and so, you know, I'm, 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 I'm all in. I've been all in for a while. We're happy to have you on the good side. <laughs> what do you think she would say about this celebration? Oh, she'd be, she'd be elated. She would, she, anybody who she felt, you know, a uh, connection to, she would feel a connection to you. She would hug them. She would, she would find out about you. She would touch and try to make sure that you, you would feel special if you met her because you are special. She would make you feel very special and thank you. And she would say this celebration uh, is, is probably more than, than she could ever imagine. And she would, have, she would have expressed her love for the university. She would express encouragement. She would have certainly encouraged the president. And, and uh, uh, man, I, I guess Darius Pryor, she would love him like a son because uh, Dr. Pryor, is, he put on this program today. He's the one who organized it with help, I'm sure. But, but she, would, she would probably um, end up adopting you guys uh, as, her, as her other additional children. And she would say, you know, this is just more than she ever imagined, but she would thank God. She would just, she'd probably just be praying, thanking God, this is just wonderful because she was such a spiritual woman and sincerely spiritual, but, but uh, very, very thankful and appreciative of everything. I said it earlier, she did not come to OSU to make history and be a trailblazer. No. At what point do you think she realized <laughs> that she was making history and that she was a trailblazer? I, I don't think she realized that until, um, until 2001, when the Nancy Randolph Davis Hall was constructed and people were telling her that and she, she even said gosh all these people are making all this fuss over me I remember her saying that she goes well I mean that's very nice but she just said wow I don't, I, okay but <laughs> she never really she never was one who was looking for any honor and she would accept it because she appreciated people who appreciated her but um, I don't think she realized that, it, that, that how magnificent it was until that time of course it, it continued to grow with her getting in the, all these Hall of Fames and then getting the, my God, she, she passed away before the building or the statues came out, but she's in heaven and saying like, wow, <laughs> wow, I'm sure. I don't know, but I, I think she would say, wow, praise God, you know.